Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 142 of the GDPR Weekly Show. And coming up in this week's episode of the show, we have news that EU Top ID 19 certificates are set for a summer introduction to allow travel across the EU. We then have news that Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs have had a data breach with their late filing penalty notices. And we then travel to Croydon, where it's alleged that an MP has committed a data breach during the local election campaign. We then have news of a data breach at musical instrument site Reverb. And we then have news that Cloud Provider DigitalOcean has had a data breach. We continue with data breach stories with the news that there is a data breach at Click Studio. And then we travel to Ireland, where the Sinn Féin GDPR breach continues to rumble on. And staying in Ireland, the Irish DPC has found itself under fire from Irish politicians for slow progress on data breach investigations into large organisations such as Facebook. We then travel to the Netherlands, where the municipality of Enschede has been penalised for insufficient data anonymisation. And we then have a story that TikTok faces legal action after allegation of GDPR breaches. And we then travel to Germany, where a court dismissed a request for a data subject's information because the employee was not sufficiently precise in their request for email data under Article 15 of GDPR. And finally, this week, we travel to Croatia, where the Croatian DPA has made a ruling in the storage of passport and ID card data, particularly for hotels and other tourist accommodation. So as always, a mixed range of articles for you this week. We hope you find the articles useful and informative. If you have any feedback for us, please do email feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive, and wherever possible, we incorporate your suggestions for improvements into the show. Unfortunately, due to the volume of feedback we receive, it's not always possible to respond to each piece of feedback individually. Stay home, stay safe. And we begin this week with news that Europe's aviation, travel and tourism sectors have all welcomed Wednesday's vote in the European Parliament on the EU's proposed digital green certificate regulation, setting in place negotiations between the Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission, which should hopefully see these certificates made operational by June this year. The ruling is welcome since common interoperable Secure and GDPR compliant house certificates represent an essential tool to facilitate the free movement of people within the EU and reopen travel in a safe and responsible way through the easing and ultimately lifting of the current COVID travel restrictions. The Parliament position brings forward several important changes to the original proposal. A new name, EU COVID-19 certificate, has been agreed to make it clearer to EU citizens and also limit the certificates used during the pandemic. Free and accessible testing. Testing is absolutely key in the fight against COVID-19 and the requirement to conduct pre-departure tests, often PCR, should not create an economic distortion between travellers. With tests ranging from £10 to £150, it's clear that such high costs could become a deterrent to travel, in particular amongst families. It is also set out to achieve full equality among vaccinated and tested citizens. No additional measures such as quarantine or further testing should be imposed on travellers presenting a valid EU Cob ID 19 certificate. The proposed amendments send a strong political message from the European Parliament on the urgency to restore free movement in the EU. This is not a privilege, it is a right as one of the pillars of the single market enshrined in the European treaties. Safely and swiftly re-establishing free movement is both possible and vitally important, not only for holiday makers but also for cross-border workers and citizens who will be able to visit their families more easily once the certificates are operational. The vaccination drive against top ID19 in Europe continues to gain momentum with now some 26.5% of EU citizens having received at least one dose. And of course here in the UK that's now over 50%. According to a recent survey, 72% of people want to travel to see family and friends as soon as possible. The sector has therefore urged swift negotiations and agreement by mid-May so that pilot testing and full implementation can begin in June this year. Time is of the essence to offer EU citizens a much needed freedom after a year of lockdowns and travel restrictions which have negatively impacted consumers' mental health and well-being. We will, of course, continue to follow this story closely here on the GDPR Weekly Show and bring you any updates as they occur. And now, the rest of this week's news. Chartered accountants across England and Wales have been among thousands of agents who've received late filing penalty notices which are not for their clients. HM Revenue and Customs has investigated and provided an update on what went wrong. 
HMRC say they were made aware of a problem with SA 326D 100 pound late filing penalty notices for 2019-20 issued on 23rd of March 2021 when agents reported receiving notices that were not for their clients, usually in the same envelopes as the notice correctly received. HMRC in a statement said that the problem was due to a software issue and the underlying cause is thought to have been linked to inadequate testing. HMRC has confirmed that the breach is limited to the SA 326D's bulk run. HMRC said the total number of individual penalty notices sent to the wrong agent is 18,496 and 15,459 agents were affected, either by receiving notices they should not have received or receiving notices that have been sent to another agent. Two taxpayers also received agent stoppies relating to other taxpayers. HMRC has reissued the penalty notices to agents. Agents are advised to either dispose of incorrectly received notices as confidential waste or to return them to SA326D, Central Mail Unit, S1250, Benton Park View, Long Benton, Newcastle, NE981 ZZ. HMRC said it's conducting a review to understand what went wrong and how to make sure it won't happen again. The matter has been reported to the Information Commissioner's Office. If we receive any update on this, either from HMRC or from the ICO, we will, of course, bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. Listeners in England, Scotland and Wales will know that we have local elections coming up this week. And connected with local elections, Croydon MP Steve Reid, OBE, has been accused of a possible breach of data protection law by passing a vulnerable to constituents' personal details onto a work colleague for them to use as part of the local election campaign. Louis Tazaridis is the Labour candidate in next week's South Norwood Council by-election. He's also a member of Reid's parliamentary staff. It's understood that at least one tenant has been approached following issues raised in letters to Steve Reid MP, which were then passed to Mr Tazaridis, but in connection with his work as a parliamentary assistant and not for use in his election campaign. It's understood that complaints have been made to the Parliamentary Standards Office and to the ICO. A resident who did not wish to be named said this very much looks like Reid and Tazaridis are using the MP's office to run a council by-election campaign in that case, Reid surely had an obligation to seek his constituents' permission to pass on their personal data to the candidate who's standing as part of that campaign. We've reached out to Mr Reid MP for a comment, and if we get any feedback from him, we will, of course, bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Second-hand musical instrument site Reverb suffered a data breach this week and urged users to reset their passwords after sensitive information, including addresses and other contact information, was publicly accessible for a short time. A statement from Chicago-based Reverb confirmed the incident had taken place but provided no details about how the data breach had happened. The statement reads, At this time, we believe that contact information, including name, address, phone number and email, was publicly accessible for a short period of time. We have no information that suggests any of this contact information has been misused. We also do not have reason to believe password or payment information were involved in this issue. Out of an abundance of caution, we have notified affected users via email. Reverb said it's conducted an investigation into the data breach and taken steps to prevent it from happening again. In a statement, Reverb said, The trust of our customers is important to us and we are committed to improving our safety procedures to keep their information secure. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800 808 5312. Cloud infrastructure company DigitalOcean has emailed its customers warning of a data breach involving customers' billing data. DigitalOcean said in an email on Wednesday that it has confirmed an unauthorised exposure of details associated with the billing profile of some DigitalOcean accounts. The company said the person gained access to some of the billing account details through a flaw that has been fixed over a two-week window between April the 9th and April the 22nd. The email said customer billing names and addresses were accessed as well as the last four digits of the payment card, the card expiry date and the name of the card issuing bank. The company said that customer digital ocean's accounts were not accessed and password and account tokens were not involved in this data breach. DigitalOcean went on to say to be extra careful we have implemented additional security monitoring on accounts. We are expanding our security measures to reduce the likelihood of this kind of flaw occurring in the future. 
DigitalOcean says it's now fixed the flaw and notified data protection authorities, but it's not clear what the apparent flaw was that put the customer information at risk. In a statement, DigitalOcean Security Chief Tyler Healy said 1% of billing profiles were affected by the breach. If we receive any update on this, either from DigitalOcean or from any of the data protection authorities, we will transmit it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Click Studios has advised customers to stay vigilant and ensure the validity of any email sent to them as a bad actor has commenced a phishing attack with a small number of customers and received emails requesting urgent action. It's understood that the phishing attack is requesting customers to download a modified hotfix moseware.zip file from a CDN network not controlled by Click Studios that now appears to have been taken down. Click Studios say they are still analysing this file. The company also asked customers not to post any Twitch Studios correspondence on social media as it's expected that the bad actor is actively monitoring social media looking for information they can use to their advantage for related attacks. According to Twitch Studios, emails can be confirmed as not legitimate by firstly the sending email has a strange domain suffix, two the wording urgent there is a bug in the latest upgrade you have to download another file to overwrite it, three the download location is a subdomain, and for the checksum provided is not legitimate for Click Studio software. If we receive any update on this, we will, of course, bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Want to ask GDPR questions live? Come and join our GDPR surgery on Clubhouse, Thursday, 4pm UK time. If you listened to last week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, you remember that we mentioned about Sinn Féin, the Irish political party which was in trouble for data which it had obtained via Facebook. It's now understood that the Data Protection Commissioner in Ireland has established that Sinn Féin did not have either a Data Protection Officer, a DPO, or a Data Protection Impact Assessment in place before investigations by the Data Protection Commissioner started. Fina Gael, Sinn Féin's greatest political rivals in Ireland, have, of course, for political reasons, have been stoking the flames of the database story all week. The party's Synod leader, Regina Doherty, tweeted, Neither King nor Kaiser, when it finally emerged that Sinn Féin's database was being stored in Germany. However, this activity by Fina Gael sort of backfired when it was discovered that Fina Gael's own public representatives were non-compliant with GDPR. One by one, their sites went offline, only to resurface hours later with newly minted privacy policies and cookie disclaimers. In a statement, the Data Protection Commissioner said they had no immediate plans to start investigating other parties rather than Sinn Féin as to the regard of their GDPR situation. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The Irish Data Protection Commission, the DPC, found itself under fire again this week, this time from Ireland's own politicians, for what is perceived as its slow progress on investigating data breaches from some of the largest companies in the IT space, for example, Facebook and Apple. In its defence, the DPC has claimed that A, it is under-resourced, and B, it suffers from the ruling in GDPR, that it should be the nominated authority in whichever country the organisation has its main base that should be the lead authority in investigations under GDPR. And because lots of major tech companies have based their headquarters for Europe in Dublin and in Southern Ireland, thanks largely to tax incentives offered to them by the Irish government in previous years, All of these inquiries, when they are made to any of the 27 countries within the EU, or indeed to the UK, are being referred to the Irish Data Protection Commission to investigate. And the Irish Data Protection Commission, I think with some justification, is saying it simply doesn't have the resource to do it all. This does raise an interesting question about whether this principle of first country is actually good for the future of GDPR. My personal view is that if it's to be continued then there should be a mechanism where maybe the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, collects subscriptions annually from the various constituent countries of the EU and possibly also the UK. And then that money is then distributed fairly amongst the data protection authorities in each country, dependent upon the volume of cases that they're having to investigate. Now, that's just my personal view, and it's floated here for opinion. I'd welcome any feedback on it. If you have any feedback, please email feedback at ddprweeklyshow.com. But clearly something needs to be done 
if these tech giants are to be investigated and penalised for data breaches in a reasonable time scale. This is an issue we will continue to keep a close eye on here at the GDPR Weekly Show and we'll bring you updates whenever we have them available for you. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The whole issue of pseudomization of data occurred in the case in the Netherlands this week. A local municipality, Enschede, was fined €600,000 in relation to Wi-Fi tracking. The Enschede municipality has lodged an appeal against the decision. It's understood that this is the first time that the AP, the Dutch Data Protection Authority, has imposed a fine on a government body under GDPR. To give a little background on this, the municipality of Anschede engaged contractors to measure how crowded the city centre was. Sensors were used to count the number of people in the city streets. The sensors gathered information on the number of people passing close by Wi-Fi signals emitted from mobile phones. Each phone was registered separately and assigned a unique code. The chase came about because the code was kept consistent across all of the sensors in the town. What this meant was that, theoretically at least, it was possible for somebody to track the movements of an individual and the plaintiffs in the case argued that it would be possible to identify that individual if there were only a few people in the town centre at that time. Monique Verdier from the Dutch Data Protection Authority said nobody should be able to track what shops, doctors, churches or mosques people visit. That is private and it should stay private so that people can be themselves without feeling inhibited by possible registration. Municipalities should put this fundamental right of their citizens first. Any system of measuring crowds in the city centre should count people but not track them. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800 808 5312. TikTok and its parent company are facing a lawsuit from former UK Children's Commissioner for England and Longfield OBE claiming that not only did TikTok and parent company ByteDance illegally collect data from children who used it since Europe's GDPR went into effect in May of 2018, but they did so knowingly. TikTok does not provide sufficient notice or transparency and does not collect the necessary consent, Longfield alleges. Further, TikTok is deliberately opaque about who has access to the data it collects. The data in question is the biometric data collected by TikTok, which is believed to be facial recognition data. It, along with other personal data, was collected for the benefit of unknown third parties, potentially advertisers, according to the lawsuit. A decision may be some time coming as the case is currently stayed, pending the result of the Lloyd v. Doodle case, which is currently playing out in the UK courts. That case is expected to have implications for the case against TikTok. The lawsuit alleges that TikTok collected the biometrics and other data which it uses to generate advertising revenue, in violation of GDPR Articles 5, 12, 14, 17, 25, 35 and 44. If we get any update on when this case is actually coming to court, we will of course bring it to you in the future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. A brief update from Germany now, where a German court has ruled that requests for copies of emails under Article 15 of GDPR must be specific. In this case, the German Federal Labour Court has ruled that the request by an employee to obtain a copy of all emails that mention the employee's name is not sufficiently precise, and as a result, the court dismissed the claim. Now, this has interesting ramifications, because what it does mean is that anyone requesting copies of emails, particularly in an employment dispute, is going to have to be more precise. And current guidance on that seems to be that you will need to specify a range of dates, and also those people who you believe the emails have been between. It would be interesting to see if there's an appeal to this ruling, but in principle, I think the ruling is a good one because it cuts down on the amount of work which data protection officers will have to do to satisfy email requests under Article 15 of GDPR. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. And finally this week, we travel to Croatia, where the Croatian DPA has made a ruling concerning data of guests staying in hotels and campsites and other leisure locations. Croatian domestic law requires these establishments to record people's passport numbers, dates of birth, etc. Many establishments, it's known, are doing this by scanning a copy of the person's passport or ID card when it's presented at the reception of the venue. 
and just keeping that scan on file to use should there be a request for future information. What the Croatian DPA has now said is that they think this is a failure to minimise the amount of data collected. And so what they're now saying to these tourist establishments is that yes, they can still scan the passport, but only for OCR purposes. So only for the purposes of extracting the name, date of birth and passport number from the passport. And then they must destroy the scan. Now, at the moment, Croatia are out on their own on this, but it'll be interesting to see over the next few weeks, particularly as we get towards the stage where the European market for tourism and business travel opens up again, hopefully, whether other countries adopt this same regime. We will, of course, keep an eye on this for you and bring you any updates in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com or phone us on 0800 808 5312. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurance production. Until next time, bye bye.